The war drums continue to roll as both North and Southern armies, navies, and governments maneuver for advantage. I'm Brendan Forrest, and this is Civil War. June 22nd, 1861. Pro-Union citizens in Greenville, Tennessee declared their preference for staying in the United States. This declaration had no political effect. The western part of the state remained in the southern hands until late in the war. The sediment, though, is not lost in that a greater number of men from eastern Tennessee joined the northern units than the rebellion. In Washington, Professor Lowe raided his balloon for another ascent. In western Virginia, George B. McClellan claims credit for the Union successes in that theater further advancing his reputation and his popularity. Professor Lowe, and an artist, ascended in his balloon to observe the Confederate forces in the area of Falls Church, Virginia. This may be the first recorded example of aerial photography. McClellan proclaimed he would now prosecute the war vigorously, a promise that, throughout the entire war, would never come true. Construction began to turn the CSS Virginia into an ironclad in the Norfolk Navy Yard, June 24, 1861. J.D. Mills of New York became the first machine gun salesman. He brought the weapons, nicknamed the Union Repeating Gun, an army in six feet square, to the Capitol. Abraham Lincoln was famous for his fascination with gadgets and asked to see the weapon. In the hayloft of Hall's carriage shop across Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., Lincoln operated the machine gun. Mounted on a light, two-wheeled artillery carriage, the gun had a single barrel fed by a revolving mechanism holding regular 58 caliber paper cartridges in steel jackets. Operators turned a crank, moving the cartridges through a mechanism into the barrel of the gun. The empty jackets dropped into another hopper for reloading. Operating the weapon reminded Lincoln of a coffee mill, and the name stuck for the rest of the war. The weapon was field tested the next day at the Washington Arsenal grounds for an audience. At the test conclusion, Major General Joseph K.F. Mansfield, the general commanding the defense of Washington, immediately requested a number of the weapons. What resulted was a great example of the ineptitude of bureaucracy. General Ripley, the chief of ordnance for the War Department, refused to take any steps to order the coffee mills, citing the need for further testing. In reality, he was afraid to take a chance on the new weapons. In October, J.D. Mills will return and sell President Lincoln 10 of the machine guns for $1,300 each. Lincoln then tried to get General McClellan excited about the weapon, but he was too preoccupied. General Benjamin Butler, bought two of the weapons. One broke shortly after delivery. The replacement part cost an additional $172.91, providing an early example of price gouging in the American defense industry. Later in the year, McClellan wanted to buy 50 of the guns, but did not want to be responsible for ordering them. He will request Lincoln order them. Lincoln will remind McClellan it is his responsibility to order weapons for his army. Eventually, 50 coffee mills will get purchased with a quantity discount of $735 each. The weapon was never utilized in any real amount. I cannot help but wonder what a few well-placed coffee mills would have done to pick his brigade as a charge across the field of Gettysburg, June 27th. The Blockade Strategy Board met as an early example of a joint staff under the chairmanship of Captain DuPont. They will consider and report on the problems the blockade was incurring, as well as future plans for amphibious operations along coastal areas. The joint staff included members of the Navy, Army Corps of Engineers, and the U.S. Coast Guard Survey. Union Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, received the following report. The rebels in New Orleans are constructing an infernal submarine vessel to destroy the Brooklyn, or any vessel blockading at the mouth of the Mississippi. A projectile with a sharp iron or steel pointed prow to perforate the bottom of the vessel and then explode. This vessel was the unsuccessful pioneer. It was designed and built by individuals, including Horace Lawson Hunley, who will become famous for the first successful submersible attack in world history, June 29th. At a state meeting, General Irvin McDowell laid out his plan for an invasion of the South. He would aim for Confederate forces at Manassas Junction. Confederates boarded and captured the sidewheel steamer St. Nicholas, posing as passengers. The ship was making a scheduled run between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. before its capture. The leaders of the Confederate expedition were Naval Captain George N. Hollins, who boarded the vessel disguised as a woman, and Army Colonel Richard Thomas. After capturing the vessel, the St. Nicholas began a hunt for the Union gunboat USS Pawnee, operating near Alexandria, Virginia. The Confederates failed to locate the Pawnee, but they seized two schooners, the Margaret and Mary Pierce, and the Brig Monticello, as they sailed the St. Nicholas down the Chesapeake Bay, a highly successful expedition. June 30th. The warship CSS Sumter, led by Commander Semmes, ran the blockade at the mouth of the Mississippi River and successfully escaped to the high seas. 
This marks the beginning of the distinguished career of Raphael Sims, one of the most successful commerce raiders in world history. Monday, July 1st, the War Department in Washington approved the recruiting of troops from the border states of Kentucky and Tennessee. This decision would be wise because at the end of the war, over 125,000 Kentuckians and 50,000 Tennesseans joined the Union. The Confederate privateer Petrel, a vessel so old it was rejected by the Confederate Navy and only placed in service by Southern private investors, escaped the blockade around Charleston Harbor by escaping over a sandbar. July 2nd, the Battle of Hoke's Run, or Falling Waters, or Haynesville, Union Major General Robert Patterson's division crossed the Potomac River near Williamsport into the Shenandoah Valley. Patterson was to keep the Southern forces under Joseph Johnson fixed while McDowell moved against Manassas. Confederate leaders Johnson and Beauregard had similar plans. They fixed Patterson in the valley while quickly shifting Johnson's forces to the aid of the Creole and Manassas. Moving quickly, Patterson's forces marched on the main road to Martinsburg near Hoke's Run. Union brigades encountered the Confederate regiments of Brigadier General Thomas J. Jackson's brigade, driving them back slowly. Jackson's orders were to delay the Federal advance only, which he does, withdrawing before Patterson's larger force. Also on this day, Lincoln conferred with Major General John C. Fremont, the Pathfinder, before sending him to St. Louis. Fremont was one of four major generals promoted by Lincoln at the beginning of the Civil War. He was the 1856 Republican presidential candidate, and after urging to Lincoln from his friends, he was appointed to the command of the Western Department. Lincoln long regretted this action. July 3rd, Patterson occupies Martinsburg, but will remain inactive until July 15th. His future bungling will result in relieving pressure off Confederate forces in the Shenandoah Valley, allowing Joseph Johnson's army to withdraw and support General Beauregard at Bull Run. July 4th, both sides celebrated Independence Day 1861, venerating the colonial forefathers. At a special session in Washington, Lincoln called for Congress to provide at least 400,000 men and $400 million to pursue the war to a speedy conclusion. July 5th, Missouri State Guard divisions under Governor Claiborne Jackson, concerned about General Nathaniel Lyon to the rear and Brigadier General Franz Siegel to the front, moved to engage. Jackson forces enticed Siegel's attack that assaulted both ends of his lines. The Confederate attack forced the outnumbered Union forces into retreat around Carthage, causing a setback to the advance of the Federal forces. This also provided Southerners in the West Hungry for good news, a minor victory to champion. Total cost of the battle were 200 Confederate losses to the Union's 44. That night, Siegel's forces fell back, and Jackson then moved to link up with Sterling Price. Brigadier General Franz Siegel, a German immigrant with experience in the Baden Army, lost his first of a number of embarrassing battles. He was an inept leader, but popular among German immigrants. His soldiers proudly proclaimed, I'm going to fight mit Siegel a saying that became their slogan and their favorite song. The fever of war continued to burn fierce in both the North and the South. No major engagements have occurred to the state, but the amassing of two armies in so close a distance, the Union forces in Washington, D.C., and the Confederates in Manassas Junction, prove that soon a clash will occur, a clash in which the outcome no one at the time was really able to predict. Thanks for watching this installment of the Civil War. To hear more about the engagements happening in Missouri, click here. And please remember to like and subscribe. We'll talk to you soon.